Hi, welcome to Language in Film, where we take a closer look at how language is used creatively in cinema. The Gal Who Got Rattled is the fifth story in the 2018 Western anthology, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, written and directed by the Coen brothers. This story stands out as the longest, and in my opinion, the best story of the movie. In this video, I want to break down why this story works so well, what's the message behind it, and point out some subtle details which really showcase the prowess of the Coen brothers as screenwriters. So first I'll review the plot and characters briefly and then move on to my analysis. I'll divide this story into three parts. Parts one and three are single scenes, while part two contains the bulk of the story. Part one is a brief introduction that occurs at the dinner table of a boarding house. We're introduced to Alice Longabau and her overbearing brother Gilbert and Gilbert's yappy dog, President Pierce all of whom, we learn, are about to set out with a wagon train bound for Oregon. Gilbert has a prospective but dubious business opportunity there and plans to marry Alice off to his business partner once they arrive. The scene opens with a discussion of the nature of a cough one of the boarders recently had. I heard it through the walls. He made noises strange noises which he characterized as a cough <laughs> as well as oddly an argument over the structure of the nervous system the nervous system spreads its tendrils throughout the body the nervous system does not have tendrils i don't pretend to be a physician this hints at the fact that alice has a quote nervous disposition part two is the journey across the plains towards oregon from the start, Alice's life is changed by a series of unexpected problems. Her brother dies early on, leaving her with a hired hand who demands $400 from her, which he claims her brother promised him to continue driving the wagon. Alice seeks counsel from one of the trail bosses, Billy Knapp, who helped her bury her brother. Billy helps her through this ordeal and ultimately decides to ask for her hand in marriage. Alice agrees, and they plan to start a family once they reach Oregon. Another important plot element is the presence of her brother's dog, President Pierce. The dog's constant yapping draws complaints from the other travelers, and Alice agrees to let Billy Knapp euthanize the dog. The dog escapes, however, and is later heard barking in the distance. Alice makes the fateful decision to go find the dog, which leads to part three. Part three is a long action sequence where the other trail boss, Mr. Arthur, rides off to find Alice. Once he does, they are both attacked by a war party of Native Americans, and Arthur impressively overcomes the seemingly overwhelming odds. But Alice shoots herself after misreading the situation and believing Mr. Arthur to have been killed. Part three is adapted from the 1901 short story, The Girl Who Got Rattled by Stuart Edward White. Many of the details are lifted directly from this story, where it's actually the male who's the protagonist. The girl being protected is little more than a caricature and is portrayed as naive and foolish. It's clear that the Coen brothers took this straightforward action-adventure story and decided to build on it, Coenize it, if you will, radically changing the female character and making her the central figure instead. This section of The Ballad of Buster Scruggs is a master class in subverting expectations. In fact, the subversion of expectation is really the theme of this story. Since we can't know our future or the consequences of our decisions, as humans we live in a frequent state of having our expectations of the future subverted. Thus, to illustrate this point, our expectations are continually subverted throughout the plot of the gal who got rattled. And this isn't easy to do once, much less repeatedly, because subverting expectations in a story still requires that the subversions be believable and not simply come out of the blue. For example, the first subversion occurs when Gilbert suddenly dies at the onset of the journey. Notice how, while this is unexpected, his death is adequately foreshadowed by the dinner conversation in part one. <laughs> Frightening. I've never heard such a cough, and this cough did not respond to any kind of syrup or elixir. The argument over whether one of the prior tenants had a, quote, nervous cough or not turns out to be a key revelation. Indeed, it was not merely a nervous cough and was passed on to the dinner occupants. 
which is not at all surprising given the landlady's tendency to encourage the diners to eat each other's half-finished portions. The bowl came to me last. Yes, there's more. We don't stint at this table. I just scoop from her plate, Mrs. Halliday. Grandma Turner's quite done. Without a prior setup like this, Gilbert suddenly dying would strain credulity and feel awfully convenient in service of the plot. So a certain amount of foreshadowing must occur ahead of time in order for the audience to buy into his sudden death. And yet, if the foreshadowing is too obvious or clumsily handled, then the death will be foreseen and therefore will not subvert expectations. One reason this story is just so good is in the way it expertly foreshadows the incidents which repeatedly subvert our expectations so that they are simultaneously unexpected yet believable. Take this scene, for example. What are you doing, Israel? Walking backwards. Don't do that. Why not? I said, don't do that. Don't do that. Why is this brief scene included? What purpose does it serve to the larger story? I scratched my head about this for a while until I realized it immediately follows Billy Knapp's proposal of marriage. After he and Alice discuss the possibility of starting a family, we immediately cut to a family that's already established. It foreshadows the family Alice and Billy plan to establish once they settle in Oregon. This is a cruel trick, though, because this never happens. What I like about this scene is the fact that the family dynamic isn't idealized. The humor of its dysfunction distracts us from the purpose of the scene as foreshadowing, in much the same way the humor of part one does. Oh, you... I just scoop from her plate, Mrs. Halliday. Grandma Turner's quite done. If instead this had been a romanticized picture of marital bliss, the purpose of the scene would have been too on the nose. Or perhaps it's meant as a cynical commentary on Billy and Alice's plan. I could see it that way too. But either way, this scene is there to suggest that Billy and Alice's future will be one of marriage and family, even if it's not all it's cracked up to be. That would still be a happy ending compared to the one we get. Our expectations for a happy ending to this story have already been set up cleverly before the story even opens, by the preceding one. All Gold Canyon has an uplifting ending where the gold miner survives being shot in the back by a nefarious thief. His triumphant outcome has us hopeful for another such tale. We're further led to believe this due to the swelling music of the next section, and the comedic tone of part one. So, after all this setup, the gal who got rattled turns out to be, in my opinion, the most tragic story, not just in this movie, but in the entire filmography of the Coen brothers. Even No Country for Old Men, which is the prime contender for that title, ends with a glimmer of hopefulness for the future. I knew that whenever I got there, he'd be there. This is not the story of one journey, but two, and it's Alice's internal journey which is the more significant one. Now, Alice will never reach Oregon, but her internal journey is a different matter. We watch her go from being a nervous woman under the thumb of her oppressive brother to a happier one who takes a more active role in her own fate. Her journey is evidenced through her gradual willingness to stray further and further from the safety of the wagon train. Early on, she watches her brother coughing from a distance, but her anxiety keeps her from crossing even that short distance to check on him. She leaves the train the next day as Gilbert is buried in the company of the two trail bosses, but shows a fearful reaction when Billy Knapp mentions, Better anyway not to advertise to the Indians. Well, they don't bother us none. Another scene occurs later, after the marriage proposal, when we see Alice straying further from the train. Best not to get too far from the train, miss. This is Alice beginning to let go of her nervous disposition. So that when part three does arrive, it's believable that Alice would be so far from the wagon train. When part three begins, Arthur discovers her holding President Pierce and laughing. This is a poignant image because it shows us that Alice is on a path towards transformation if indeed she isn't already there. The laughing Alice of act three is not the Alice of act one. It is the central irony of this story that her inner journey from fear to freedom will also be the cause of her untimely death. That's the ultimate subversion of this story. 
One would expect the opposite, that positive growth and change should result in a happy outcome in Billy and Alice reaching Oregon and settling down. But the Coen brothers refuse to give us that. Instead, Alice's transformation results in her winding up where she is at the start of Act 3, enjoying the moment but oblivious to its danger, far away from the safety of the wagon train, which she left in order to search for the dog that she once despised. And let's talk about President Pierce. There's a reason he's in both the opening and closing shots, because he's a vital piece to this story. Upon rewatching The Gal Who Got Rattled, I was amazed at just how many functions this dog serves. Let's start with the obvious. He is the reason Alice leaves the safety of the wagon train, which transitions us from part two to part three. But he also smoothly transitions us from part one to part two. The little President Pierce, bless him. Where, where is he now? <laughs> Alice's relationship to the dog, like her willingness to stray from the train, helps demonstrate her inner journey. At the start, the dog is an embarrassment for her. People are wondering if he will bark all the way to the Willamette Valley. She gladly accepts Billy's offer to euthanize it halfway through. Mr. Knapp, you are very kind to extend yourself. Here we go, little dog. And yet by part three, she purposefully and fatally decides to take compassion on the dog. Why? What changed within her? President Pierce is obviously a reminder of her brother and the stranglehold he used to have on her. We will propose. Uh, once they meet each other, I'm sure Alice will pass muster. Well, the match is a good one. I'm joining him in a business opportunity. And Alice can be very sociable and attractive when she has a mind to be. She doesn't always have a mind to be. To him, she was property, just like President Pierce's property. There are property rights. The dog is my property, my property barks. There you have it. Gilbert's claim on both her and the dog equate them with one another. For Alice, the dog represents her old self. In an attempt to rid herself of this, she lets Billy try to put the dog down. But by part three, she seems to have let go of this negative association. It's like she's finally accepted herself as an agent in her own life, as an individual free from the overbearing presence of her dead brother, and can finally see President Pierce for what he really is, just a yappy little dog. And so she decides to rescue him. She no longer cares about the complaints this might bring from others on the wagon train. It's the compassionate thing to do. It's what is right. Shall I confess I have no money? What is right? What is right? The fact that the dog escapes death at the hand of Billy Knapp is yet another subversion of our expectations. As we watch him take the dog off, we assume that that's the end of the poor creature. But we've never actually seen Billy Knapp use a weapon. We assume he's a good shot, but he turns out not to be. Yet this actually makes sense, given the gentle disposition that we've witnessed from him. Such a kind heart would not be an expert in killing the way the hardened Mr. Arthur turns out to be. As Billy returns from the failed execution, he says, I should have deputized Mr. Arthur. That man is a crack shot. Which again foreshadows the events in part three. But there's an even more subtle parallel between this scene and part three, which really showcases just how deftly the Coens can write a good script. After Billy suggests euthanizing the dog, Alice asks if they might just let it go instead. But Billy says, And a wolf might play with them? No. Or he eats him. Faster is better. Yes, I understand. Why is this important? Well, especially considering how Alice and President Pierce are equated with one another, part three presents the possible scenario which Billy warns her about in this scene. Only instead of wolves toying with the dog, it's the potential for the war party of Native Americans to, quote, toy with Alice. This is businessmen no. along about. They catch you, it won't be so good. After they take off every stitch of your clothes and have to weigh with you, they'll stretch you out with a rawhide and then they'll drive a stake through the middle of your body. Now, I'm not condoning the stereotype of Native Americans as, you know, savage wolves, but this is the portrayal that Arthur relates to Alice. So this is in her mind, on top of the fact that Billy Knapp has already explained to her that... Faster is better. Yes, I understand. Thus, it's more believable 
that Alice would choose to euthanize herself, as she's already been primed to think of the wilderness as a merciless and brutal place. Alice's death and the failed killing of President Pierce are both mercy killings, to spare them a more painful fate, supposedly. Since President Pierce survives the attempt on his life, we, the audience, are primed to hope the same will happen for Alice. But it doesn't, yet again subverting our expectations. And it leaves us with the unsettling question, why does President Pierce deserve to live, and yet Alice deserve to die? If Billy Knapp had successfully killed President Pierce, then the dog would not have been alive to lure Alice from the safety of the train, and therefore she wouldn't have died. In other words, one is triggered by the other, and so both cannot live. So the dog's life and Alice's death are causally connected. One of these lives must be sacrificed for the other to survive, and for reasons beyond our mortal comprehension, events happen to play out in the dog's favor. It goes without saying that part three is the grandest and most obvious subversion of our expectations as it overturns the entire story that's come before it. I mean, it's really a shock the first time you watch it. And yet, the groundwork has all been laid so that it's believable. The character of Arthur is really ingeniously designed, and his actions in part three are yet another, and I'm starting to get tired of saying this phrase, subversion of our expectations. He's been on the periphery in part two, where he rarely speaks, and when he does, it's just a few words. Condolences. You're going back. It is very quick, Carlos. You go back. Uh, will you be going back, miss? He barely makes eye contact. When we get to the Willamette Valley. High price. And usually leaves when Alice shows up. He appears thoroughly uninterested in her or social connection in general, the way he is silent, even around Billy Knapp, his partner of 12 years. It's a nice little sleight of hand to make him the star of part three because we would expect it to be Billy Knapp. Though given Billy's inability to even deal with President Pierce, I'm not sure that they would have fared much better had he been there. Arthur transforms in the face of danger. He springs into action. He says more in half a minute than he has since the journey started. And just check out that eye contact. He is unfortunately so convincing that Alice follows his advice once it appears that he's been killed. Having Arthur single-handedly fend off a slew of attackers is a surprise that is outmatched only by Alice's death. And personally, I don't interpret Alice shooting herself as a result of her nervous disposition. Rather, I feel it's a result of her taking a more active role in her own destiny. In fact, I doubt the Alice of Part 1 could have made the difficult choice to shoot herself. The fact that it winds up being the wrong choice is not really her fault. It does appear, even to the audience, that Arthur has initially been killed. The fact that he hasn't isn't something we could foresee. The dog, Arthur, Alice, indeed all living things, live or die by the hand of events that are invisible and incomprehensible to us. Call it fate, call it chance, call it the will of the Almighty. Whatever label we give it, the one thing we know is that we cannot know it. The uncertainty principle. It proves we can't ever really know what's going on. But even though you can't figure anything out, you will be responsible for it on the midterm. This is the moral of the gal who got rattled, and it's stated in the final scene of part two. Billy and Alice are now betrothed and on a first name basis, which is for the time period a huge signifier of their growing intimacy. It is their last scene together. Alice tells Billy that her brother was certain of his beliefs. All of his beliefs were quite fixed. And talked down to her for being uncertain in her opinion on things. He would upbraid me for being wishy-washy. I never had his certainties. But Billy validates this uncertainty. Uncertainty. That is appropriate for matters of this world. I believe certainty regarding that which we can see and touch. It is seldom justified, if ever. I talk about this theme of uncertainty more in depth in my video on the mortal remains, the sixth and final chapter in the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, so be sure to check out that video if you haven't already. I just want to point out one interesting way in which this idea is quietly dramatized 
in the gal who got rattled. And it relates to the nature of Alice's brother Gilbert's illness. There appears to be a discrepancy regarding what kills him. His main symptom is a severe cough. <coughs> the same cough discussed at length at the dinner table in part one. However, after he dies, we hear these lines. Yesterday morning, he was fine. It is very quick, cholera. So I'm no physician. I don't pretend to be a physician. But cholera is a disease of the digestive tract. I did some quick research on the symptoms and I couldn't find where a cough is listed as one of the signs of cholera. A persistent cough is associated with another well-known disease of that era though, tuberculosis, which affects the lungs. But tuberculosis doesn't kill you within a span of days the way cholera does. So which is it? Cholera or tuberculosis? Or something else? I guess there's a chance that this is an error or oversight on the part of the filmmakers, but I feel like that's highly unlikely. So if it's not a mistake, then the nature of the disease is left intentionally uncertain. Nobody knows what it is. Billy Knapp calls it cholera, but he's no physician. Furthermore, the dinner guests are at odds over the nature of the cough. It was a nervous cough. I would not rent to a contagious cougher. I've never heard of a nervous cough. So all things considered, I interpret this as one manifestation of the mortal uncertainty Billis and Alice are discussing at the end of part two. Down the ages, from our remote past, what certainty survive? And yet we hurry to fashion new ones. The same uncertainty which leads Alice to prematurely and tragically end her life. All right, that'll wrap up the video. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Please check out my other videos on the Ballad of Buster Scruggs if you haven't already, and let me know in the comments if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it.